Hey everybody. Um, I hope you all had a good weekend. Um, so I'm on here to do a review of a documentary um, that I, I recently watched. It's called Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power. It's a Peacock original and Peacock has done some really good um, black documentaries like The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks. And so I'll be doing some more of these. Um, I'm not reviewing Real Housewives of Potomac tonight. I'll do that tomorrow. I'm sure I'm not missing much. And if I am, I'll catch up. Um, but I wanted to talk about this documentary and it was, um, it was, it came, you know, to production um, via streaming in 2022. So it starts with the late great, and, and the thing was Lowndes County, I knew all about it, uh, a lot about it, um, because that is where uh, the Black Panther symbol starts to take um, root, along with Black people organizing around voting. But it does a good job of you know, highlighting these historical issues. But it starts with the late, great Shiro, um, the greatest of them all, Ella Josephine Baker, saying that those in power don't, an uh, old interview of her, she died um, December 13th, I want to say 1987. Yeah, because she was born December 13th and died December 13th. Um, you should look her up. Anyway, saying that those in power don't abdicate easily and that people are usually waiting on a great leader to tell them what to do and people have to have faith in themselves and they can only get that faith when they have the opportunity to grow. And that was Ella Baker's thing um, really throughout her life that she believed in organizing people so that, you know, they could, you know, empower themselves. And then we get um, the horrific, that horrific and purposeful and calculated act of violence against Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and so many others at the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, who were brutalized for trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, as a nonviolent demonstration in the form of a march. Now, why is this important? And this is something that I try to teach my students in understanding when people are talking about nonviolence, and Martin Luther King is probably the one person that believes in that as a lifestyle. Um, most of them saw it as a strategy, but as they're nonviolent and people call it weak and this and the other, these are the same people that would get to run if the police pulled up right now. And um, <laughs> don't get me started. But what's important about that is that there was a rise of international media in the 50s. So even the image of Emmett Till, this sort of violent acts that they, they know, they can predict that these white Southerners are going to have and flip against them. The rest of the world is seeing this as the U.S. and the Soviet Union are the two major superpowers. And they both are trying to get these newly decolonized African and Asian nations on their side, um, be it for capitalism, be it for communistic purposes, whatever. And many of these African and Asian nations are not siding with either one of them because of the totalitarian efforts. But they also, people like the Soviet Union, also used the violence they watch against, which at the time they were referred to as Negroes, in the U.S. as a reason to tell these African nations, those side with the U.S., see what they do to their people over there? And they just wouldn't stop. There are literally pictures of Bull Kiner, you know, beating people and, and, and on billboards in places like South Africa and the Congo. So don't think this is a sign of weakness. This took a lot of strategy on the part of black people. So there's a black man who's talking about Lowndes County, how it was one of the poorest counties in the country. At that time, he said the first shower he ever took was in high school in the gym in the 1960s. And I said, that's a goddamn shame. And I hope it's not some ignorant person out there like, oh, well, that's not bad for them. Yeah, it's always for them. That's good enough for black people or too bad for black people. Like, get out of here. So he said they had no power. Um, they would lose their jobs, their families for trying to register to vote. And by that, I mean murdering them. Um, the county was 80% black, but they had no black police officers, no black political officials. This is what we call oppression. All right. They were nearly everybody in the county. We're not talking about a city, county. Um, were sharecroppers. They wanted to go to school. They wanted their kids to go to school, but they didn't really have schools. Um, they had to start working at ages three, four, and five. Those are the ages you had to start working in slavery. OK, and couldn't go to school for half the year because everything was built around the crops and your parents needed the money and white people would just straight up not fund these spaces. 
okay? And denying people an education is a human rights violation. And I can say that even for the 60s because the UN Charter was created in 1948. Anyway, um, so then there was this white woman who tells how she grew up in Lowndes County and said, you know, she really didn't notice racism. She just knew black people worked for them and they loved them like they were family. I said, baby, <laughs> white lady, if you don't get up off my screen, and I know them producers put her in for a reason. But anyway, she was like, there was an incident that really pulled the curtain back for me. And I was like, oh Lord. And she was like, um, her and a friend were like joyriding and a black man tried to fl flag them down or whatever. And her friend was so angry that the black man was trying to stop them. She went back and told everybody um, back in town. And the woman was like, and they killed that man that night. And she said, it turned out that we had a car like somebody else's. And there was, you know, a white family or whatever who knew him. And if he flagged them down, they would just give him a ride. He thought they were them. And this man lost his life over that shit. The fact that white people can kill black people with impunity then and now should have us all enraged. But you know, some people, they don't give a damn. So anyway, Lowndes County was so known for its violence that it was referred to as Bloody Lowndes. Lots of black people came up missing. That's what they would say. They were like, they would just kill us. Doesn't that sound like today when black people go missing? And they're murdered, like all those jail, like all those bodies behind that Jackson, Mississippi jail that we just going to act like didn't happen. I'm not going to act like it just didn't happen. Look it up. So even in a county of 80% black, zero goose egg, official zero. Black people registered, there was zero black people registered to vote in 1965 out of 5,000 plus eligible voters in that county. Black voters alone. So John, there's a man named John Hewlett, and he was in somebody who was from Lowndes County, so on and so forth. They said he went to Birmingham for a while because he wanted to join an active chapter of the NAACP. He learns about organizing, so on and so forth. And he came back as a registered voter in the 1950s. He had learned, you know, these things that the NAACP had helped him do. When he came back, he wasn't coming back to start a political movement. He came back really because he had some family issues. And... He said when he went to Birmingham, it felt more free. I said, fuck, if Birmingham, Alabama felt more free in the late 50s, god damn. Okay? And that in and of itself should tell you a lot. Like a lot of times these movements, people try to act like some of this is calculated. And then sometimes, even with the Montgomery bus boycott, their goal was really just to have a more humane system of segregation, by the way. It was when white people just wouldn't give them anything. They said, fine, then let's just go for broke. We want this integrated. If we're going to fight and lose our lives over this, and they're not willing to give us just a bid, forget it. Okay, so the root of this is white racism and white supremacy. They need to check themselves. There's enough telling black people how to avoid their racism. They could just stop being racist. And if they can't just stop, then they need to work on it. Get to work. Anyway, so it takes him, John Hewlett, he takes himself and 39 other black people to register to vote in Lowndes County. They already knew what was up, but the point was they were going to demand their rights. So him and these three other black men walked in the register to vote. That white man apparently got angry, lost his mind, but he was a little scared and said, well, if y'all want to vote, leave your names here. You know, and that's so they could find them and, you know, try to do whatever they needed to do, take them out. They wrote their names down and they said they kept coming back with more and more black people to vote. This is what I think a lot of people miss is that in these Southern spaces where they are so used to dominating black people, telling them what to think, and they were running that footage and they'll be telling black people, I bet you don't think this, just to kind of gaslight them and control them. Racial gaslighting is so old and powerful that just the way you're on a job and you have to have training for like sexual harassment, mandated training. I remember watching that and I was like, if they did this shit around race, I wouldn't have to work another fucking day in my life. But they ain't going to do it because that's what white people like to do, including them white women. Yeah, I said it. So anyway. In this process, they decided to organize and they became something, I, I may have gotten the name wrong, the Christian Voting Lowndes County Group or something like that. So Martin Luther King, obviously being part of the SELC, you know, uh, being in Birmingham, um, heard about it, called it out as he did, went down to help them organize, support them over their right to vote. I mean, Martin Luther King had so many near-death experiences. I don't know how that man could get out of bed. 
I'm, I'm getting there. But the SELC, SELC is um, the acronym for Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They couldn't establish a presence in Lowndes County at that point because it was so dangerous. All right. So at this point, we're like the mid 60s and Martin Luther King Jr. has had bombs uh, thrown at him, you know, mob cocktails thrown at him in marches. His house has been bombed with his baby and wife in there. And they've been violently, physically attacked over and over again. Okay. He had been through it. They could, it was just too dangerous. Everywhere they went was dangerous already. So they, you know, they had their foot in there. And Martin Luther King was also doing, working in Chicago at the time, um, trying to get people to recognize that poverty in these ghettos, he said, because he wanted to learn. He lived on the west side of Chicago. And that's still one of the scariest places now to live. Um, he wanted to figure out what the problem was up north, that every time he would talk about their demonstration, they were like, this wasn't their problems. And he went up there and he was like, oh, yeah, this is different. But that's what I appreciated about Martin Luther King. He was constantly growing, constantly learning, and really dedicated to the freedom of his people. And I think that's why I get so aggravated when people say Martin Luther King Jr. was weak or they feel the need to bring up he cheated on his wife as soon as his name comes up. She found out, y'all, okay? And the FBI sent her tapes of him with other women which was cruel to her and intentionally designed to destroy his family and therefore the movement. J. Edgar Hoover, in case you didn't know, um, that was the head of the uh, Federal Bureau of S Investigation known as the FBI. That's why when black people say the FBI has gotten involved, like it's going to mean something as in terms of justice for us, I don't understand. That entire organization has been designed to destroy black movements from the gate going back to Marcus Garvey, but I digress. So J. Edgar Hoover had actually threatened Martin Luther King that if he didn't kill himself, he was going to expose his affairs because they had tapped all his phones and rooms everywhere he stayed. First of all, y'all are the sickos. And y'all had to really struggle to find something because we're not going to act like John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy weren't both fucking Marilyn Monroe. Okay? But see, that don't get brought up the same way. And black people got to do a better job protecting our heroes. Anyway, and Dr. King... Um, when it was sent to his wife, he admitted it. Now, Coretta Scott King, a college-educated woman and activist before she met Martin Luther King and after and until the end of his life and just absolutely gorgeous her entire life, um, could have been so angry that she divorced him, done interviews all over the place, because you know they would have loved it, even then. Um, but she understood that was between him and her and did not want to see the movement go down the toilet. And for Martin Luther King to die at 39 years old, Okay? They're young like anybody else. They were figuring it out like anybody else. And Coretta Scott King had enough selflessness to say this isn't, I'm not willing to throw away the movement. Or my husband. For people that I know are my enemy. Okay? So all this he cheated on his wife, get the fuck over it. It's not Charles' place. And rest in peace, Dexter. Because I can only imagine what it is to have your father taken from you so early and so young and to constantly see his murder replayed over and over again every year and regularly because Martin King was that big of a figure and this is your father. This wasn't just some worldwide leader that you learned about in the history book. And y'all need to come up off that. Anyway, and Martin Luther King, and let me tell you this to y'all who don't know, Martin Luther King died at 39 years old, and when they did the autopsy on him, he had the heart of a 65-year-old. This wasn't in the documentary, but I want y'all to understand what we're dealing with here. He had the heart of a 65-year-old man. I want you to let that sink in, the kind of stress and pressure that man was under. All right? So fuck everybody who acts like they are so above him and don't appreciate what he did. He ain't do that much. Get the fuck out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. And people can say we don't need leaders. Well, then why the fuck do people go to the polls? And those of you who don't, somebody is still leading you and making decisions for you. So get it together. And it's always like when this black people is charismatic leadership. And that's the takeaway from my ability to think. The bottom line is people do need leaders. You do. You do need organizational things. And people who say that are the people who tend to do the least organizing and are the least politically involved and tend to understand the least about politics and certainly electoral politics, so on and so forth. 
I digress, but it's important that I point this out. So anyway, they talk about SNCC. SNCC is uh, the acronym for Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee. You can look it up. And this was full of black college students, uh, many of whom had followed Martin Luther King's lead and tried to register people to vote, sit-ins, nonviolent protests, so on and so forth. Ella Baker, however, helps found SNCC. And she encourages all the people that have relationships with Dr. King and the SCLC, uh, people like uh, John Lewis and Diane Nash. Diane Nash, who was the real leader of a lot of this stuff. And John Lewis never took anything away from her, but I just say that because <clears throat> she only seems to have her name brought up when it's with him. And give her her flowers, okay? Because these people are true freedom fi fighters. And shout out to Fisk University, because John Lewis and Diane Nash both alums. All right, then you have people like coming together for SNCC. People like Stokely Carmichael, later changed his name to Kwame Ture, Cleveland Sellers, um, Bob Moses, um, most of whom are out of Howard, Marion Barry, who was the first black mayor of D.C. Um, but Ella Baker sees them in this organization and she tells them, you know, don't become a youth division of the SCLC. And Ella Baker felt this way. She helped found the SCLC. But she understood, as she said, the egos involved and that women didn't have leadership roles despite doing work in those roles. And so Ella Baker wanted young people to really invest in themselves and to have their own organization. And I think in many ways to kind of prevent sycophants and also because she knew. She knew how, you know, sexist those places could be. Um, even because all of these things, you know, they always have more women than men. Um, now, let me pause here parenthetically. I really want to encourage black people specifically and my people, especially African-Americans here in the U.S., to look at our history holistically because there's too many lies told about our history, which is why I'm doing this video. I think the ignorance that exists, and I say ignorance because there are a lot of people who don't know or don't read our history, and we can say we don't get taught it in schools, and yes, we should and by and large, we don't. And that's why we all have a responsibility to educate ourselves and our kids or people we just know um, who could use the knowledge and to pass along the knowledge when and where we can, hence this video. So go back and look at some of my Black History playlists uh, if you're interested. All right, but it's, it's not either or in terms of understanding our history. It's not Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, okay? It's Dr. King and Malcolm X. Okay, it's not W.B. Du Bois or Marcus Garvey. It's studying and appreciating W.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey. It's not the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or the Black Panther Party. It's the Southern Christian Leadership and the Black Panther Party. That's all a part of the Black Freedom Movement because Black people have different ideas. You don't have to pick a side. But understanding and learning about our history, sorry, sorry why am I doing this, um, helps us get a better vision and a compass, if you will, for how to um, deal with the struggle. It doesn't have to be an either or thing. And our history can be debated um, to understand future strategies and ideas, but not like um, this or that. Like, don't take a side and then decide, I'm not gonna read about people or learn about that. That's ignorant. Like, do what you're supposed to do and help. Help yourself as much as you can. So Ella Baker goes on to say, um, she knew about all the egos involved in the SCLC and then in this interview, cause she's an older woman in the interview, um, she had passed, but they were showing the footage and she was like, y'all better stop me from talking before I, because I might start telling the truth. I said, you better go off. All right. So then they show an interview of Stokely Carmichael, um, and he's passed and he was given Martin Luther King, you know, the credit and the point that when Martin Luther King was coming, um, down to Lowndes County, he was like, the cameras would be there because the cameras just followed him, you know, not because he was looking for, it, he was like, they just followed him. He said, so he knew there would be a march and maybe even some legislation. He said, but there wasn't always an organization or apparatus in a lot of those smaller Southern towns that he would go to help because he was fighting a lot of battles against injustice. And he was planted, he had, you know, kind of headquartered places in Atlanta when his uh, parents wanted him to move back so he'd be safe for his family and stuff. And, you know, he wasn't there, but because of that structure. And that's what Stokely Carmichael is learning from and how to improve it. So he said SNCC wanted to help organize an apparatus for Lowndes County, Alabama. And once again, they took the lead of Martin Luther King and what he had accomplished thus far, looked at it and evaluated the model to help improve the situation. That's called a movement. 
It, like I said, it doesn't have to be either or. So SNCC was headquartered in Atlanta originally. And a lot of black women helped build it because we know we become the unsung heroes and I don't want to be a part of that. So Judy Richardson, Ruby George Smith, people who were active in a lot, and not only SNCC, but these, just these causes on a regular basis. So anyway, we get a man in Lowndes County who lived there and said the overwhelming feeling of black people in Lowndes County towards SNCC when they came was positive. He was like, but a lot of the black people understood that it was bloody Lowndes for a reason. And some people were scared. That's understandable. And I don't think black people being scared is somehow some irrational thing. Shit happens to us. Okay. Um, so as Judy Richardson pointed out, one of the SNCC activists, um, she said that, yes, it was called Bloody Lounge. And these black people lived there and had been experiencing violence for a long time. Um, so they understand the impact of white violence. And we're showing up. And that's why I think, think it can be beneficial to have people who have lived there for so long to help guide you, but also young people who are just crazy enough. Um, Reverend Lowry used to say that. Um, there's good crazy and bad crazy. Good crazy enough to think you can change something. All right, so Stokely Carmichael <clears throat> was the project leader there, okay, in Lowndes County. He was only like 22 or 23, but at this point he was a veteran organizer by the time he had been to jail a two dozen times he you know had finished at Howard with his degree in philosophy and was doing sit-ins like you know he was in it so while Carmichael and SNCC are handing out flyers for a mass meeting about how to organize in Lowndes County um the black school principal calls the police like the coon he was um to tell them because Stokely Carmichael had showed up what he believed they were doing and yes they were getting ready for a mass meeting but that was still a coon move dummy anyway and Carmichael believed at some point, um, believed that at some point in grassroots organizing, that the people are going to see you interact with the powers that be. And so when they called the police, he was like, oh, don't worry about this. I know what to do. I done, <laughs> I done been there, done that. And he said, I know why y'all are here. So what are y'all going to do? And so they kind of fell back for a second. And it's really, like I said earlier, because white people get shocked when black people talk to them like we're fucking human beings too. And so he started taunting them, was like, look, y'all need to arrest me or let me do what I have to do. I said, well, go off, Stokely, go off. Um, and the point of that was because the example is that I don't know how scared or frightened Stokely Carmichael was most of the time or Martin Luther King. But they went at it every day of their lives. And I can tell you right now, that's not easy. And to then try to be the example for people so they're not scared. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage. So then we get a woman named Ruby Sales, um, who was a field secretary for SNCC. And she said she joined because Stokely made it sound liberating. And she said one night a white man came up to him, put a gun to his head and said, nigga, you'll be in hell tonight. And she said Stokely Carmichael even with the gun to his head, looked up and was like, well, tonight hell will be integrated. <laughs> I can't. And that, meant, and that was still a read because that meant everybody down there is white. Anyway, and she said that sold her. She said because he was not scared. And that's why leaders are important. You do need examples, especially the people who are not afraid to teach you how even if you are afraid to act in the face of your oppressor. So Carmichael um, said fear immobilizes you. And if you're scared, you're dead. Martin Luther King used to say that. It's you start living when you're not afraid to die. So Ruby Scales uh, said that she had a white friend or he became her friend. And he was a white guy who was in seminary. His name was John Daniels or something. Um, and they were drag racing and stuff. And he had come down there to help with Lowndes County. Then they went to go get a drink out of a corner store, like just because they were thirsty. And as they walked up, because of course, white people stay watching black people. That's what they do. And knew who she was, even if she wasn't stunting them like that, because she didn't really know who they were. So she's just walking into a corner store and this white guy walks out with a shotgun and said, bitch, I'll blow your brains out. And she said it was, you know, shocking. So, of course, she's like, and he did shoot. But the white guy that she was with pulled her back as it happened. She said, but it all happened so quick in her mind. And he ended up shooting the white man in the stomach. And him and another priest named Father Morosro, I think, um, he shot him in the back as he ran. And the way they described the story 
in the press conference, I'm talking about the member. New York got to be the noisiest city in the world. Um, the way they described the story, I'm talking about the members of SNCC in the press conference was crazy. It's a miracle that any of them made it out. So then in the white community, they said um, that Tom Coleman, that's the man who shot, who meant to shoot Ruby Scales, who shot the white man, was the victim when the civil rights workers had a knife and it was self-defense. And she was like, the story changed just that quick. I said, it still does. Think they won't bring up your suspensions and stuff when there's a kid that gets shot or you felt threatened by Tamir Rice's toy gun. So the level of violence, I don't give a fuck what anybody says against black people in this country is nothing short of genocide. And you can go find the book. We charge genocide. Okay. Um, according to the UN's definition of genocide as of their 1948 charter catch. All right. And I ain't going back on that shit. So then they went to court and Ruby Scales said she was going to testify. And she said her parents encouraged her to do it despite the fact that, you know, they were scared, but they knew that this was part of a movement. So they said the town, like the white people in the courthouse treated it like it was all a joke. They're taunting the black people. And she said the town gathered around him though and gave him money for his defense. It's Tom Coleman, the guy that shot the man. I said, sound familiar? Isn't that what happened to Mike Brown's killer, Derek, somebody, Chauvin? You kill a black person and the white community gives you money. And of course he was found not guilty. They give people money before they even charge. So what's the money for? A reward? Get the fuck out of here. So anyway, this guy, Tom Coleman, was a deputy sheriff and he showed the extent to which white people were willing to go to maintain their white power structure. They said that in that documentary, like that was a surprise to me. But once again, I, I you know, maybe I had a different experience growing up in the deep south. But anyway, so there was a black man who had an additional house and he gave it to the members of SNCC. And he told them, look, he said, it doesn't have running water or bathroom inside the house. You have to go to the outhouse. He said, but I own it and you can stay here. And that says a lot in a sharecropping town. You know how hard that black man had to work for that? And he was still willing to sacrifice it in the name of the movement. So they had a place to stay. And they started calling it the Freedom House. And they said, but there were black people living all around them. And all of those black people had guns. And they said they knew they would protect SNCC because they appreciated what they were doing. Um, and they said the house was important because it gave them an address to have residents in the county, therefore being able to register to vote, you know, that kind of stuff. So meanwhile, black people were also being evicted off sharecropping lands for registering or trying to register to vote. Okay. And these people are poor, poor. And I don't know why white people act like they don't need workers, but see, you can scare people when this is all you had. Um, so they had to, <coughs> and many of these black people got evicted and kept going. They wasn't begging for their jobs back, even though they didn't know what to do. So they had to set up, uh, set up tents on these far out kind of outskirt areas and it became known as Tent City long before the 2008 crisis when white people had to do it for the first time. So they said it became a shooting gallery, literally for white people. So black people had to mobilize against that. And they were like, if you didn't shoot, you were certainly going to get shot at. And they were like, it wasn't safe. And so these black people who have now had to move in tents because they got pushed off the land and y'all are mad that they're asking for their basic civil citizenship right to vote. And now y'all going to murder them for sport? Get the fuck out of here. This shit is wild. So they talked about how they didn't have a lot of money or food. But the resources they did have, they were like, we shared with each other. And what, even if it was knowledge, what one didn't know somebody else did, and that helps you grow. And I think that's a good way to be. And we could talk about all this generational wealth bullshit. It's all built on capitalism. Okay? Teaching people how to love, teaching people how to not be so selfish and to care about other people is more important. And something that can be passed down no matter how down on your luck you get. I'm not saying I don't watch your money and shit, but I'm just making a point. All right, so Linda Baines Johnson is shown giving his speech about the 1965 Voting Rights Act, calling the civil rights people heroes, like we don't know you was on tape, calling Martin Luther King that nigga preacher because you didn't appreciate him coming out against Vietnam. But okay then, in terms of actual bills, fine. All right, so you need a federal act to ensure black people have the rights they were supposed to have at birth, after the 14th Amendment. 
The minute black people became citizens, all of that should have come with the right to vote. But no, then you had the 15th Amendment that was supposed to protect black men's right to vote. And then you have these white women going around saying, well, black men got the right to vote even before women. And the hidden adjective in front of women is white women. And no, they didn't because they were hanging them left and right. And black people did not have federally protected rights to vote until 1965. And black women weren't ever included in either one of those realms. Anyway, that was not a long time ago. Okay. Are people born in 65? Are they even 60 years old yet? No, they will be next year, right? Some bullshit. All right. So the summer of 1964, SNCC had moved their headquarters from Atlanta to Greenwood, Mississippi. All right. So they did this despite what Roy Wilkins of the NAACP said to them. He said, all you can do is going to be limited in a place like Mississippi because it's too violent. They're too resistant to black rights. And he wasn't. And I have my issues with Roy Wilkins, generally speaking. Um, but, you know, I won't take away from him, you know, his presidency, the NAACP and what he did. But even in that, he wasn't like, it wasn't like a Uncle Tom move. It was like, I'm telling y'all, it's scary down there. Because he's the one that had to go down there um, for Mega Evers and also for Emmett Till. He was like, it's just in their blood. They are so vicious with everything they do against black people. Um, and you know, it's really kind of like younger people just trying to protect you, you know, like just know what, what you're getting into. So think about the bravery though, the boldness and the calculation they took to headquarter themselves in a place like Greenwood, Mississippi. And we'll get into that further in order to help the, the freedom movement. These people aren't getting paid. These people are make it just making it. And that's what I mean about being, learning not to be so selfish. Because we have a lot of emphasis on the individual and self-care. And I think all that's good. Self-care, not individualism. But then we wonder why we have so many mental health issues. Because everybody's taught to only look out for themselves. The bottom line is humans need community. Anyway, so Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. In case you've never heard of them, that is an organization created by black people in Mississippi to make sure that their voices were heard in the federal government because they were not being allowed to vote in Mississippi. And they damn sure crashed the 1964 Democratic National Convention and I am here for it. In 1964, to ask to be delegates that will represent African-American interests from Mississippi to push Lyndon B. Johnson and the Democrats, particularly the Southern Democrats, because they hadn't merged into the Republican Party yet. This is still 64. They were still considering themselves Dixiecrats, Southern Democrats, all right? And the Southern Democrats weren't going to acknowledge their interests because they were clearly helping them not vote by being members of the Klan, so on and so forth. So the Democratic National Convention, that's when, please look that speech up, Fannie Lou Hamer was like, our lives be threatened daily, constantly for trying to vote. And this woman looks like she, she, I mean, all the anger, all the rage, all the sadness that came with that. And the DNC offered them two seats at large. Now I'm going somewhere with this, which means you are a non-voting part of the delegation at the Democratic National Convention. And Fannie Lou Hamer and them other people that came up from Mississippi were like, no, we didn't come up here for no two seats where we can't even vote. And the other members of SNCC that were with them refused to compromise and they go back with the mentality, they go back to Mississippi and just, they was like, fuck them, but we gonna get them. With the mentality that politics is not about morality, it's about power. And we can't reason with these motherfuckers no more. So that example, and that of their headquarters in, in uh, Greenwood, they decided that we're going to learn from this and we're going to do something about it. So Lowndes County is still on SNCC members' minds at this point. And the literacy rate was extremely low. I told, just told you they couldn't go to school. They had to work since the age of three. But they found out you could be an independent party and run on the ballot. Stick finds this out. So they eventually come up with um, the, uh, what's the name of the organization? I'll tell you in a second. But they come up with the Black Panther as their mascot. Now, John Hewlett liked the Black Panther, all right? Because the illustrator, uh, the person in Snake who was designed to come up with them, a mascot or whatever, wanted a dove. And at that point, everybody was just really pissed. They said, look, we're not looking for peas. It's pretty and everything, but we're not doing that. So she goes back to the Atlanta office and she happens to go by Clark Atlanta and she sees the mascot. They have a Black Panther as a mascot. And she decides that's good. So she decides to draw it. And SNCC loved it. They loved it. And John Hewlett 
uh, pointed out that cats are typically peaceful animals. Cats in the cat family. Until you back them up in a corner. And essentially black people have been backed up into a corner at this point in history. And now we're about to pounce. Okay. So I'm moving forward with that. People were like these folks in Lowndes County had never voted in their life. And now SNCC is coming with a whole apparatus and organization, not just saying they want the right to vote. We're going to create a party for our interests because you can do that in Alabama. Now the white supremacist party that they had was fine. That independent party was fine with a white rooster in it. And a lot of black people were like me, a sheriff. And they were like, why not? You need to police your own community. And they were like, well, we don't know what, you know, how to do it, what's involved, this, that, and the other. And they were like, you, so they started explaining to them, like, are you against police brutality? You've seen how the police treat y'all. And they decided, SNCC decided they wanted to put in mechanisms as they talked about these different jobs to help educate and bolster the confidence of black voters. Um, and they decided they would use comic books as a way to make it plain. I love it. I love it. I'm a big comic book person, graphic novel person anyway, but that helps people understand. And so this woman was like, a lot of our pictures were crude. I was like, don't, don't feel no way about that. Cause it's not your fault. The clan was crude and violent. You was just making it plain. And they were like, even things like a tax assessor. And you know, they were like, what is that? And they were like, the thing is, that's a huge part of why black people are impoverished uh, because Tax assessors have allowed the overtaxing of black people for centuries in this county, and that increases black poverty. And then the underpaying of taxes by white people that allowed them to not only have, but constantly have more at the expense of black people's poverty. So they start trying to explain these things, and this is the way to power. So they said they needed a program uh, after they registered black people to vote. Because like I said, their Carmichael pointed out, you know, it's great when Martin Luther King comes, you know, to different rallies and stuff. But what he was noticing as a young person was that in these smaller Southern cities, they needed an apparatus. So that's what they decided to do. So they are marching because a man named James Meredith, he was a student who integrated the University of Mississippi, uh, went out marching and he called this the March Against Fear. And he said that he would not allow violence against black people to keep him from voting, certainly after what had happened at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, like they started the documentary with. They shot him. They shot him. They didn't kill him. I'm sure they meant to, but they didn't. Now, at this point, SNCC was changing from an integrated organization to a black one because they felt like white people were racist, even the ones that were claiming to help them. And they're coming in trying to tell black people what they should do and shouldn't be doing. And black SNCC activists were like, no, we don't need you telling us what to do. Yet we've lived this our whole lot. What we need you as white people to do is go and talk to your white communities because they the people we don't understand. We don't know how else to say this stuff to them. That's where the work is. But white people weren't ready to do that and weren't willing to do that. And that's how you know it's racist because the presumption that black people need their help to make them feel better, they was over that bullshit. All right? And I agree. And John Lewis um, was still kind of sticking with the morality plan and nonviolence. Once again, he was... You know, very close to Martin Luther King. And that was a bit out of step with where many of the SNCC members were going. So they end up voting Stokely as their president. And John Lewis had been a previous president. So Willie Ricks, who later, like Stokely Carmichael, changes his name. Stokely Mar Carmichael later changed his name to Kwame Ture. Um, but he was Willie Ricks at this time. And said, well, you know, look, I just came from one of the nightly meetings um, with the local people. And I used the term black power and the people loved it. I think now we have a program. We have something we can rally them around, right? And Stokely gets arrested, okay, again, by trying to help black people register to vote again, okay? And they said he was hot this time, though. He was hot because he was like, I'm so tired of being arrested for this shit that ain't illegal. Like, they are really dedicated to our oppression. And they said, well, now that you're out, look, now that you're going to make the speech the next night or two, um, later after he was arrested, he, they were like, use the term black power. We tried it out. And he was like, nah, y'all need to cool it on that. Like, I, I mean, I know, but this may not be the move. Shit. He was, you know, that was just his opinion. Right. But they said, nah, I'm telling you, it's, it hits with them. So then he made a speech where he said how white people have kept us out with violence. And this is just in the yard because they had kicked, but he had added so much stuff. Um, how white people had kept us out of things with violence in the South. 
and with their laws in the north. Facts. This shit is not limited to the south. And he said the people of Lowndes, the next time they ask you what you want, you say black power. Black power. And people just kept shouting it. And black power, and this is important for people to get, because people throw these terms around. This is what I mean by studying your history. I wasn't trying to offend anybody, but this is important for us to be able to articulate that. And black power was about black people having political and economic power. And by political power, organizing parties, and then being able actually to vote for those parties. Like black people were getting killed for the right to vote. And then that's why I hate when I hear, I remember I had this white teacher it said was like, well, people gave their lives for people to vote, black people to vote, and then they didn't vote. First of all, we do. My parents never missed the elections. Two, when Oprah gave that speech and she was like, you're doing your ancestors a disservice. Fuck you. Black people should have never had to die, okay, for the right to vote. It should have been theirs at fucking birth. Don't play with me. Now, whether people choose to exercise it or not is their choice, even if I do think it's still important to vote. I am saying it's still their right. Nobody shames white people because they feel like, oh, that's their right to do whatever the fuck they want to do. It's ours too. Just saying. So anyway, um, so black power is about having political and economic power. The same power that white people have had for centuries. And they didn't want that. <clears throat> and of course, white Americans in their guilt and racism start attacking it. They get nervous. And in the words of several people, it's that white people were afraid and fearful that black people were going to do to them what they had done to black people for now three centuries. So the next time they tell you they don't think shit was bad, they a motherfucking lie. Cause you, you don't get that kind of paranoia for no reason. Every time black people resist, it's like, oh, well, why didn't they, why did they do it this way? Why didn't they do it? Why January 6th is Spider-Man meeting the Capitol building? <laughs> like all that crazy shit they do, they're smashing pumpkins when they lose a game and shit at college in Connecticut and places like that. Where's white leadership on that? Get the fuck out of here. And black people, that's why y'all got to stop being so hard on each other and ourselves every time we make a mistake in public. White people don't highlight theirs. They live to highlight ours. Anyway, and that's not a mistake, fighting for black lives. Anyway, so now Martin Luther King and Carmichael were like big brother and little brother. And him and Stokely disagreed about the term of black power. And Martin Luther King, though, was very clear in interviews. Oh, no, I completely understand it. It's not that I don't understand it. And think they're wrong for believing in it. I just know the media has the potential to take the connotation of that and basically pervert it. And that's exactly what they did. But at the same time, white people are going to do that anyway. Right? So you got to keep fighting and using what you have. So Lowndes County Freedom Organization, that's the name of it. <clears throat> Lowndes County Freedom Organization was the name of the party. But they started kind of referring to it as, oh, yeah, that Black Panther Party, because that was the mascot. And I think white people intentionally do that the same way they intentionally don't learn how to pronounce our names correctly. To distort, to diminish and to belittle. And so that was the name of the organization. The Black Panther was a symbol. And that's what, what um, Carmichael worried about because they kept calling it the Black Panther Party. And he was like, and that bothers me. And this is before the Black Panther Party had even started. He said, because it took away from the fact that this is a black political organization to mobilize and organize black people to be able to exercise their rights to vote and have a, something to vote for that has been so long denied them. And y'all are going around calling this the Black Panther Party. This is the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. We have a Black Panther. And the Lowndes County Freedom Organization was the party's name. So they finally get somebody on the ballot in 1966. And they literally have to warn black people that after they vote, they said, don't hang around. Get out of there. Go protect your house. Because they coming. And now you tell me how free is free when you can't vote without the fear of death and violence. And it's still that way. That's why they do these ID laws and, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And then closing down all the polling places in black communities and making them travel two hours in Alabama, Georgia, all those other places. Fuck them. Okay? And just because you don't live there doesn't mean you shouldn't be outraged as a black person. Anyway, okay, so they get somebody, and remember when Georgia made it illegal uh, for black people? Uh, I mean, they said for people, but they really meant for black people. Um, to pass out water in those long-ass voting lines when they were trying to vote for Stacey Abrams to be governor and trying to get Trump out, all of that shit is purposeful. They can get them laws passed in no time. Now, these white people were placing ballots in this 1966 election where they actually have a party on the ballot, a black party, um, 
They went place ballots in the swamps, driving up their trucks, threatening black people who were sharecropping their land about who they could and could not vote for. And basically they would kill them if they didn't. And the local people were like the federal government government wasn't any help because they didn't do anything to end these illegal activities. And that should tell you how the federal government has failed us over and over again. And that's why who's in power matters. The same way the federal government increased the fugitive slave law, the restrictions on it, making it a felony if you did not return a slave to the South and by helping any of them be free. Don't tell me that the federal government has not been complicit in our oppression and then make it this Southern thing. That's the dangerous thing. Yeah. The South deserves its reputation, but the North is fucking racist. I can tell you from somebody from Georgia, now in, living in New York, get the fuck out of here. So these white people, anyway, and, and they lost this election. I mean, they also were getting rid of votes. Lost this election, but the black people kept going. And this was one of SNCC's ma last major organizing efforts as an organization, because they end up dissolving. They go in different directions. Um, because the black people in SNCC start a lot of infighting. And the destruction of the organization, they were like, it was also because they really didn't want those white people in it. <laughs> and they were growing up. They were, you know, having different differences. They were like, they are simply saying at this point in history, because they're interviewing Silly Carmichael, and he was like, I don't understand why this bothers y'all so much. We are simply saying that we're no longer going to just march and let white people be violent against us and not fight back. And they were like, well, isn't that violent? No, the violence y'all heap upon us that leads us to defend ourselves is the problem. Get the fuck out of here. That's self-defense. And that's, ooh, that shit was pissing me off even watching it like that. So this, yeah, like I said, so many of six members left Lowndes County after they had established a party because a lot of them weren't from there, but they felt like the apparatus was in place and they went on to do freedom struggles elsewhere. Like even Stokely Carmichael was fighting rebellions in uh, West Africa. He married Miriam McKay, but a famous jazz singer from South Africa. Like, but... He had to essentially go into exile because he was on the FBI's most wanted list. They were afraid he would become the next quote unquote black messiah. Um, and you can look that up too. But the symbol of black power, not black power, the symbol of the black panther evolves. And then it's borrowed from, borrowed by people like Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, who are the two people that co-founded the Black Panther Party uh, for self-defense in Oakland, California. They eventually dropped the self-defense part in 1966. And the rest is history. Um, but please note that the Black Panther Party was not like a political party, even though they were heavily influenced by what was going on in Lowndes. They were essentially black socialists. Um, they believed in breaking that capitalist system that had allowed so much poverty in a nation that was the wealthiest, which was actually true at that time. And they weren't focused on electoral politics in the same way, um, but creating community programs like the Free Breakfast Program, the Free Shoe Program, uh, the Sickle Cell Research Anemia Program to help the community. And then they presented these as like, if we can do this with the little we have, then why can't the federal government do it? Which is why the free breakfast program even became a thing by the first uh, black congressman from New York, uh, Adam Clayton Powell. All right. He introduced that in the Congress and he was over the um, House Education and Labor Committee and helped push that through. Shout out to him, Reverend Adam Clayton Powell. All right. Um, so the Lowndes County Freedom Organization eventually merges with the Alabama Democratic Party. You know, like I said, because then the Southern Democrats eventually merge into the Republican Party. And that man, John Hewlett, who got this, a lot of this started, was elected as the first black sheriff of Lowndes County. I was like, isn't that incredible? And black people were happy for him because it was 80% black. And they needed someone who understood what black people were doing. I mean, what white people have been doing to black people and why this stuff needed to change. Then there was a lady named Yurle, um A. Haynes, and she was the first superintendent in the county, and there was a man named John Herbers, um, the guy whose father uh, was the one who gave Snick that house, the Freedom House to live in, ran to be mayor, and was the first one, I forget the name of the city, but he was the first one in Lowndes, the county of Lowndes ever. Um, and when we get to the end, black people in Lowndes are still struggling, white people still have power and own things, but even as they're talking to people that reflect, they were like, but what they do know is that they can organize. And I'm a firm believer every movement will not always have the finish that we want in the historical moment that we want. But the example and the history serves as a compass as to where we can go. And the problems changed. We went through the whole so-called colorblind era bullshit all the way through George Bush's era and white and black people were on that fuck shit too. Um, and now you can't get away with it. Things will change, right? 
And just like Coretta Scott King said, you know, freedom is never really won. It's, it's, you got to fight for it and win it in every single generation. And I'm messing up the quote here, but I think about that often. Um, yeah. Um, so we get that. And it's just such a reminder when you can still see members of SNCC being interviewed and they're healthy, walking, older people, but they're talking clear and lost their mind. And you realize this wasn't even that long ago, how young they were and their activities and that they're still pretty young people, like early 70s. So I always think about Martin Luther King's last speech. I really do believe that was the prophecy of God. I don't know when we're going to see it, but we will get to the promised land. So anyway, y'all be sure to like this video. Leave your comments, your thoughts. Take a look at the documentary. Um, subscribe to the channel. I'll see y'all soon. Bye.